All right, hey everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday Tech Talk. Make sure to get that into the clip uh, when we make the video for YouTube. But welcome to another Tuesday. It's lunch and it's time for Dirk to give us a Tech Talk about questions for surveys and how to make them better to get more effective answers out of them, I'm guessing. So yes. we'll find out. So without further ado, take it away, Dirk. Okay, hello, yes. Um, as you know, I uh, used to teach at a university, so uh, now you get my master's lecture on survey design <laughs> for free. Uh, no, in all, uh, in all uh, sincerity. Um, uh, I, this is pretty much a lecture. I was gonna do a bunch of interactive stuff, but I can, for example, ask you, who has ever done a very terrible survey? But then all of you are gonna raise your hand, so don't worry. Uh, and who has spent way too much time on it that they say, you know, it's only two minutes and then 20 minutes in you go, this is ridiculous, but you know, sunk cost fallacy makes you continue to do it. And, and have you thought about the other side of it? I mean, what kind of answers are you getting as a you know, person collecting, uh, making, doing, making the survey, collecting these answers, when people sit in your survey 20 minutes in going, is this thing ever gonna end? I don't even know anymore what the difference is between this question and next, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm gonna do in these slides is a couple of uh, things about how to create uh, survey questions. And I'll give you this, these spoilers ahead. It's really, really hard, and the advice is very helpful, but if you see it, you go, well, yeah, I could have thought it up myself. The trick is you don't think of it. You know? And it's still hard. So even if I after, after I've given you all this advice, it will continue to be hard, and you'll continue to go, oh yeah, I didn't see that, when somebody else looks at your questions. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so um, let's start. Um, if this thing would want to go to the next page. There. Um, did you like the food and are you ready for me to give this talk? Good example of a bad question. Because <laughs> it actually asks two things. We'll get that to in a, min uh, in a minute. So let's, do, uh, let's talk about what good questions do. It's very simple. They're clear and concise. Yeah, we can stop right here. It is very, very hard to get questions to that point. Yeah? This is the part that I can't give you any advice on, and it's the most important part. Get them to be clear, yet concise. People tend to go to either extreme, or it is like, you know, very short. Did you like it? Um, yes, good, but what means it mean, and what does like mean? Or they get very wordy, you say, Did you, how was your experience with the, you know, and they get lots and lots of details, and nobody reads that question. So those, those are two poles that you have to always find the middle way in, and it's just super, super hard. Uh, a little easier is avoid jargon, and if you must use it, explain. Here's a good example, um, kind of from real life. Uh, you recently contacted the help desk. We are here for all on-prem ICT problems. Do you feel the help desk was, was the right place to go to with your current problem? Francis S. What can you say about this question? And then they nicely have an agree-disagree uh, line which I'll talk about later. What's wrong with this question? It's wordy. It's wordy. Yes, it's very wordy. What does, what does ICT mean? What does on-prem mean? mean? Yeah, right. What, right mean? what does the right place mean? Exactly. What are my current problems? What, what, um, okay, yeah, what are your current problems? I mean, we're assuming somebody comes in. So that's a, you recently contacted the help desk. So I'm assuming they have an idea about what their current problems are, but we don't know yet. Yes. There's another problem. You recently contacted the help desk. Do you feel it was the right place to go? Well, they went there, <laughs> so obviously they thought it was the right place to go. <laughs> you know, and that's really hard. I mean, if you look at this question, I mean, we look at it for 30 seconds, and we blew like six holes in it. Yeah, and that is what makes question writing so hard. Yeah, and that's why you need to always sit there with a bunch of people and not do it all in one go, but look at your questions again and again, day after day. Um, here's another good one. Uh, don't even try to read this. This is the first page of a questionnaire. Look. Everybody's going to do exactly what I just did. They're not going to read it. So why write it? <laughs> yeah? Everybody feels the need to have a three-page paragraph why this is important. Why do you do that? Let's be considerate of those people's time. They've opened your questionnaire. Clearly, they think it's important enough. Now let's get on with it. Yeah? And, and this principle, be, be mindful of your um, respondents' time, is really, really important. It also means that your, that your progress bars, as much as they're often broken in survey uh, software, try to get them as right as possible. People hate it when they're you know, continuously halfway to survey, and you do question after question, and you're still halfway in the survey. Um, so, other stuff. This is the easy part, you think, and is again, really hard to avoid. Um, should we introduce a law to stop malicious lawyers from extracting outrageous compensation from innocent citizens? Everybody will say yes to this, right? Because it's such a loaded question. I mean, 
unless you're a lawyer yourself extracting exorbitant amounts from innocent citizens and you think they're not innocent, then, then you'd say maybe no to this. But everybody else is going to say yes to this because everything in the wording of this question points to how terrible this is. This is really hard to avoid because you have an opinion about this. That's why you write in the survey. Ideally, often, you want to hear that opinion back because that, you know, basically validates your opinion. So it's really easy to have these words slip in. This, this one's pretty extreme, but it's hard. In general, avoid, should, would, could. First of all, it, it's loaded, but also everybody interprets it differently. You know, should we? Well, you might say yes, as in, well, yeah, you know, in the next 20 years should move there. Or you might say yes, as in, yeah, and tomorrow. These are two very different yeses, and you don't know what the difference is. Be very careful around adjectives. You know? How did you experience our top-rated program? Yeah, right. If I thought, I thought it wasn't so good, but you just told me it's top-rated, I'm, I'm feeling kind of bad, right? We'll come to that later. But yeah, if you put these adjectives in that kind of tell you something about what you're asking about, then people are picking up on that. They, they clearly hear that you, the questionnaire writer, want to hear that it's top-rated, and that is good. So they'll pick up on those words. Just say, how did you experience our, rate, our program? And there's no reason to... Squeeze a top rated in there. The problem with that is that often you'll have to use some vague wording to avoid what we said earlier, to get all these details in. So often you say things like, how was your experience? It's kind of undefined what your experience was. So it's kind of, it, you know, it isn't necessarily leading, but that tends to be kind of vague. So you have to find, again, the fine line between leading words that kind of give the people enough information so they know what you're talking about, trying not to be leading, and trying not to be wordy. It's very, very, very hard. Um, options. This is really hard, uh, easy. So okay, uh, really hard. Sorry. You've done the question, right? Yeah, more or less. We'll talk about more things later. Now comes to the answer. In general, do some really st simple stuff. Add an other option. Yeah, other dot dot dot, and let people fill in the other. You know, because there may be many answers out there that you didn't expect. Yeah, in the fifties, you know, people thought that was gender was binary, and that you know all the questionnaires showed that gender was binary. People checked either male or female. Because those were the only two options you gave them. So guess what? They all ticked either male or female. Now you can actually say other, please specify, and people come up with all kinds of other things. Yeah? It's not that it didn't exist before, so, you know, but it's also that we didn't know to ask for it. And then you look at your own results and you say, see, it doesn't exist. So it's an interesting cycle that you can break with a simple other, please specify. Um, also, always add an escape hatch prefer not to answer. Yeah? We'll come to that later to required versus optional questions, but if you do have a required question, ideally give people that option. Here's a good uh, indication of how that can go wrong. You indicated that you ate at gre uh, Joe's Greasy Spoon once every three months. Why don't you eat at Joe's more often? It's already slightly loaded, if I may say so. But what's the other problem here? It's out of the way for me, is answer one. The lines are often too long. It's too expensive. No other. There is no other. And what kind of others would you expect, or would you throw in, you think? Too many rats. Too many rats, yes. <laughs> I'd leave that in the other. I don't think I'd put that in there. <laughs> like they don't like the food. Maybe they don't like the food. Yeah, precisely. The spoon is too greasy, yes. <laughs> Maybe the, you know, they only go there when they're having a party. You know, there's all kinds of reasons. And, and a couple of them could be quite frequent. But yeah, this is often thought from the perspective of the manager of Joe's Greasy Spoon, who assumes that everyone wants to go there as often as they can, because the food is delicious, right? So these are the only three things that they can come up with that are reasons why people wouldn't come there every day. Regrettably for them, people are more varied than that, and some people go, I actually don't like the food. I go there when, you know, at the end of my long drive, that's the nearest restaurant that's nicely convenient to a gas station. That's why I go every three months. You know, when I visit my family in faraway land, that might be a valid answer. You haven't given them that option, you won't get that answer. Um, so, I already hinted at this a little bit. So, once you've done your questions right and you've thought of all the answer options, now go test it. Yeah? Have somebody read it with a very critical eye. Yeah? Ideally, ask that colleague who, you know, it can be very, very harsh. <laughs> Don't ask your friendly colleague. Ask your not-so-nice colleague. And they'll go, that, that's no good. No, 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 no. And ask a creative colleague who can go, really? Is that all the answers, answer options? Really? Can you interpret it this way? You know, really critically look at your questions. Um, when you make an actual psychological questionnaire, one that's kind of standardized, it often takes about a year. A year to create one. About half a year writing, half a year testing, normalizing, and another half a year, you know, creating standards for it. So this is a very long process. There's just no other way around it because there's so many open, there's so many problems around, and there's often not the best way to do it. It's all 
uh, yeah, trying to find a balance again. Uh, remove all sources of potential confusion. And again, with the enemy being get too wordy. So you want to find that balance again between being very clear, nobody can interpret it in this way or that way, yet it's short and sweet. Um, then ask a second person. And they'll give you different critique, and they'll move questions that you just rewrote this way and rewrote, rewrite them back the first way. This will invariably happen. And then ask a third and a fourth person to do all the questions and time them. See how long it takes. Because I always think my questions take about five minutes, and they tend to be like 55 minutes. And maybe it's not so bad for you, but even if you think people go through it real fast, even if you time yourself, timing yourself is absolutely wrong. You have no clue because you've read, read these things before. So you've got to time somebody who's never seen it before and see how long they honestly take to answer all the questions. And the result usually is that you have to remove a bunch of questions. It's just always the same. Um, some other more technical bits. Here is the one that, you, uh, that I started with. You know, did you like your food and can I start the... Um, the talk. It's so called, it's so, uh, the so-called double-barreled question, you know. It's, it's a question that is two questions in one. And how are you going to answer this, you know? Maybe you weren't ready with your food, but you were ready for me to talk. Or maybe you didn't like the food, but you're ready for me to talk. Maybe you were very much liking the food and not ready for me to talk. Maybe both, maybe neither. What are you going to do? Yeah. So look for words like and and its family members. How likely are you to go out for dinner and a movie this weekend? Now, dinner and a movie is a nice, you know, package that we often talk about, but if I say yes to this, that's great, and I do both, but maybe this weekend I'm you know, going just for dinner uh, because there's no interesting movies, and I'm going to say no. Really, I'm doing the dinner movie packet because then I'm going to go home and you know, watch the TV, some TV, but you, because the way you asked me, I'm going to say no. So be careful around that. Yeah? So again, ask multiple questions instead, or simplify. And this gets very tricky. Uh, here are two interesting questions about gun rights. Do you support gun rights and the Second Amendment? That's a straightforward one. Because there's an and there, you know, and you could, can, if you think about it, you can see people who would support the one but not the other. Here's a trickier one. What do you think is more important, to protect the rights of Americans to own guns or to control gun ownership? So there's an or instead of an and. And people have argued that this is a false dichotomy, because maybe you can do both. And this is interesting, because this is how the Pew Research Center uh, looks at uh, support for gun restriction versus uh, uh, more open gun laws, and has done over the last 20 years. So there was a whole discussion in 2015 around this, and they decided to keep the question the same. Because if you do a longitudinal studi study, what you want to do is keep that wording exactly the same. Because if you change it only slightly and you get different results, then, well, then you don't know. Has the opinion changed, or has the wording changed? And that points at something important, the wording always will influence the answer you get. So if you change the wording, you'll get, basically you're doing a completely different question. And it's, it can be very subtle, uh, which is why there's a nice link in the back, why Pew decided that even though this, uh, this question is not perfect, they're going to stick with it. And that then led to a whole storm that people said, oh, the question's flawed. And they went, no, 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 wait, it's not perfect. You know, Very few research questions are perfect, because there is always some drawback to them. This one's pretty good. It's, it's not perfect, because there is a flaw. You could consider that this is a false dichotomy, but they thought that not too many people would uh, support that. Um, the upcoming survey for pivot engineers had a very interesting one. Do you, the clients and the uh, client management, all support the goals, aims, and processes? If you write this out, this is nine questions in one, <laughs> right? Because there's three groups, and there's three things that they can agree on. So what are you going to do, right? Think of your current assignment. Do you, the clients, and the client management all support the goals, aims, and processes? I don't even know where to start on that answer, right? Because, <laughs> well, there's enormous differences in my current or last project between the clients and the client management. They work at, you know, completely at odds about certain things. So now what am I going to do? I'm probably going to do middle, because it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know. So that's the problem of a double-barreled, or in this case, nine-barreled question. Try to avoid them. The problem is, again, you get so many questions. So that's, that's the dimension we haven't talked about too much yet. We've talked about earlier, if you make them too wordy, your questions get too long. If you split up all these questions, you get too many questions. So again, you have to just pick and choose. The other problem is that people make things up. Yeah? Uh, especially on potentially obscure topics, include don't know option to avoid stuff like this. Should we stop American poachers coming into Canada from catching all our silverfish? It is slightly leading, but that's not a problem. The problem is that people said yes to this. You know, there's wonderful silverfish. I hear some giggling in the back of the room. Because silverfish are these and they live in your carpet. 
<laughs> when I, I couldn't find it, but there sort of were, were some really nice interviews on the street with people, you know, who said yes to this question and yes, surely, and talked about it as if they knew everything about it, you know, because they assumed that, well, if poachers come for these silverfish, they must be nice, right? And when we start to stop that. <laughs> and and it's, a, it's a common thing, of course. And the other problem is, as you all know, the less people know about something, the stronger their opinions are. So these people who don't even know what a silverfish is have really strong opinions about this. Because <laughs> the issue tends to be kind of black and white if you have no background information. So, be careful about those things. What kind of questions can you ask? Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, but these are some popular ones. You can do the agreement uh, questions, completely disagree, completely agree. You can do some evaluation. This was terrible, excellent, or you know, uh, was up to my expectation or didn't give uh, my expectation. You can really make any um, what they call semantic, semantic differential there. You can make, put any two words there. The drawback of using those is that people need to constantly read, okay, what is this question about? And the drawback of this one, the advantage of this one is it's always clear. Do you agree or do you disagree? But it gets kind of boring if you do it all the time. So again, you have a bit of a, you know, two, two dimensions there. You want to keep it more uh, interesting than always asking the same agree, disagree question, but you don't want to confuse your uh, respondent either. Uh, a nice tick which apply is always good. You know, have them tick a bunch of boxes. Uh, or number them even, and hey, open questions. It's more work, you gotta type in some keywords, uh, stuff like that, you have to actually read them, but it, it often can give you a lot of answers uh, that you didn't expect. Of course, if you're gonna survey 300 people, you wanna really only have one or two of those, because it's too much work. Uh, but if you have fewer respondents, consider open answers, uh, open questions. It's just good to have them there. So if you do an agreement scale, which is technical, the Likert scale, uh, from the person who invented it, uh, the standard th things are strongly disagree to strongly agree. No, it's pretty okay. Um, more points is better. Yeah? Um, so some people do this with like a five-point scale. That's great. Seven's better. Nine's even better. And actually, the best thing is this nice slider that you have here. Yeah? It's more work for your respondents to pick it up and draw it, but it makes it kind of... Here they say no knowledge expert, so it's semantic differential, but you can just move this around. Uh, they, I would have never added that number there, actually. I would have just left that open. The paper uh, and uh, pencil version of this was really fasc fascinating. We drew just lines in the old days between fully agree and fully disagree, and had people draw an X, and then over every questionnaire, we went there with a little ruler and measured how many <laughs> inches they were off from the completely disagree. Yes? Say it again? So you and I might interpret 55. I don't know you pronounce Yeah, yeah. That's true, yeah. And also, it's unclear whether I accidentally let the mouse go at 55 or 58 or even 61, right? Uh, so in that sense, you, you shouldn't take that number as a perfect number. But the idea is, usually when you uh, analyze the results of uh, questionnaires, you take an average over a bunch of people. If, if their answer is more uh, like a, an actual scale variable, so not like a dichotomy uh, or a four-way four dichotomy or something like that, the more realistic it is to just average those results. You can't actually average yes and no answers, which is not on this slide, but should be there. So some people make slides that say yes, no, maybe, or answers that say yes, no, maybe. Don't do that, you know, because you only get three answers. So you're losing a lot of information from your respondents there, because yes, no, maybe just doesn't give them much, you know. Do you like test driving? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, well, that, there, there's all kinds of gray in between there that you're not measuring. So that's the reason why you want to go to these fluent scales or nine-point scales and have people uh, click one, because you're just getting more information out of your part uh, participants. There's another thing which we'll come to in a second. People rarely use those. So really a nine-point scale in practice boils down to a seven-point scale. Uh, and a yes-no-maybe scale is basically a maybe answer. <laughs> you're going to get 90% maybes uh, if you're on a good day or on a bad day, depending on how you see it. So yeah, try nine points uh, and sliders are more work for your participants because it's just much more work to drag it than to, uh, than to click it, but on uh, some questions it's really, really useful. Frequency, yes, we often ask about, uh, so other than agree, disagree, another common question is how often do you do this, when do you do this? There's kind of three approaches, the relative frequency, rarely, never, always. That has an advantage and a disadvantage, which is that everybody sees this differently, you know? How often are you very, very drunk, yeah? If I say, you know, rarely, that might be a very different rarely for you, <laughs> depending on what your, you know, social group is or how you see is like ve getting very drunk is a, what rarely for, is for a frequency. I, I'm sure a bunch of English people would say only once a week, so rarely, you know? For me, that would be, uh, that wouldn't be always, more or less. 
So that's a, that's a good and a bad. You don't know. Sometimes you want to know that uh, relative frequency. Sometimes you don't. So another one is to ask for the absolute frequency. How often do you do this? Yeah? But that's very hard. Yeah? How often do you get a spam call? Once a week? Once a day? Yeah? You can think about it, but it's, especially when it gets in the month region, it's kind of hard. Yeah? How often do you get a spam call in Chinese? Yeah? Once a year? Once a month? I don't know. Uh, I get one a day at the moment. Yeah, so people find this very hard. And what they often do is they substitute recency for frequency. So they kind of go like, when's the last, how many can I remember? Oh, it's about once a month or once a week. So a third approach is to actually ask for recency. You know? When did you last drink Pete's coffee? You know? And then you do so many and you circle either days, weeks or months ago. Because people, then you ask them one question, how long ago was it? And of course, this has a drawback. If it still happened that yesterday they drank their first ever uh, Pete's coffee, in your frequency calculation, you'll have them down as every day. Because, you know, if the, the last time they did it was yesterday, you're going to assume that they drink one every day. So you get a better answer from your respondent, but it's harder to, inter to extrapolate it to the actual frequency. Again, there is no best way, people. It's all terrible. Questionnaire design is just terrible. <laughs> That's all I can say about it. Um, I like this one, but yeah, it has that drawback of the frequency. You can combine two things, of course. Um, here's a nice one. I'll have you more. Imagine there's half of you get the top question and half of you get the bottom question. I should have done this better, but you know. You can already see what's going on here, right? The population of Belgium is going to vary quite a bit between group A, that gets the top question, and because basically nobody has a clue about the population of Belgium here, I'm assuming. The funny thing is even true in Holland, which is just north of Belgium. <laughs> um, because people just don't know, you know, populations of countries other than their own, basically, and even their own is often a bit of a stretch. Uh, so what you do is you look at that, you look at that scale and you're going to find your answer, well, somewhere near the middle, because that scale kind of anchors your idea of what a reasonable guess would be. Um, any clue? Population of Belgium? Pretty good. <laughs> 11.4. <laughs> I didn't see you Google it, so it's pretty good. Uh, but yeah, you, in this answer you'll get a whole bunch of 8s and here you get a whole bunch of 14s. Because that's basically what people will, will uh, drift to. Last couple things. Um, actually, there's one more thing I'll say later off, uh, outside of a slide. Uh, biases. The problem is People have empathy. It's a problem that we always have in this work. People have empathy. It's, it's, not, it's a problem. Uh, the other thing is they also in consider how you as an interviewer will view them. You know, if, if they ask you, you know, how much money did you recently spend on, you know, like alcohol, and they're going to be reluctant to say, well, about a couple thousand dollars, because that kind of, you know, puts you in the, dr you know, in the same, like, you know, frequently drunk category. So people are, and they always monitor what, they, what they're trying to say. And they have a couple of biases. First one is the desire to say yes. People just like to say yes. Uh -huh. And be aware of that, especially if you have a yes, no question. I experienced this very strongly when many, many years ago I traveled to the inlands of Indonesia. And the wrong question to ask is, do you know the way to so and so? And they say yes. Because <laughs> there's a very strong cultural bias to say yes. So what you have to do is ask, do you know somebody who knows the way to so and so? And they'll point to somebody. And then you go to that person and you need to repeat the procedure. You need to again say, do you know somebody <laughs> who knows the way to so and so? And every now and then they'll say, oh, actually, I can maybe help you. Yeah? And then you've kind of worked around that. Uh, bias to say yes. People are very, very uh, have some very strong tendencies that way. People want to be normal. Yeah, I already made a joke about the amount of money, money you spent on joke, on no, sorry, on uh, alcohol or on cars. Or people want to be normal and want to see themselves as a normal citizen. So they kind of moderate their answers a bit. Then some other people want to be different. Yeah, they are going for the extreme uh, answers. So you'll always find some of these people who just go, oh, I guess everybody, you know, whatever drives one car, so no, that's with cars are not going to work. But you know, everybody likes this, so I'm going to say I don't like it. So these are different groups, obviously. And how are you going to treat that? We don't really know. Interviewer bias. That's basically that thing you like to be um, liked by the interviewer. So people are especially if the interviewer is live with you there, they're very unlikely to admit to certain things that are unpleasant. You know? Do you have sweaty feet? Most people are going to say no live. You know? Over the phone, a little better. On an internet survey, you might get a real answer. And even there, you know, people just don't like to admit to things like that. And then this one, influence of the organization conducting the survey. The standard uh, example is always the AIDS Foundation, you know, interviewing people about condom use. Everybody's using condoms when the AIDS Foundation asks them about it. Because yeah? <laughs> they all go like, oh yeah, shoot, I shoot. Yeah? And that doesn't mean they actually do. Yeah? 
so these are some really real biases that are always there. And it, again, they're hard to avoid. Um, one of the things you can do is have your uh, conduct your uh, surveys online, uh, hide who the organization uh, sponsoring the survey is. If you do it live, have very neutral people not wearing any marked clothing or stuff like that. Um, social uh, psychology researchers uh, wear shirts that say nothing on them, basically, <laughs> and make sure to have completely, you know, if they're the interviewers, you know, basically look as, as average as, as possible. And even that's hard. Um, then something about this, yeah. Okay, uh, the question is, um, what circumstance would what somebody wears make a difference? If I wear a sportsy or team shirt and I say, how much exercise do you do every week? You know, and my, sport looks, my shirt or my whole attire looks like I'm like an active person. You know, that might help you. If I wear, you know, um, uh, I'm a fancy like suit outfit and say, how, uh, how, much, how often do you think about retirement benefits? You're going to be in a very different mood than if I uh, you know, wear this and ask you about retirement benefits. People really pick up on those things. Um, required versus optional questions. Um, survey designers, of course, want to make everything required because, you know, hey, these are all your, this is all your hard work. These are your questions. You want to ask all of them. Uh, and also, when you analyze it, if you have these missing questions, people that people missed, it's just a pain, you know, you have to do stuff with it. It's much easier if you have a question on every single, if you have an answer on every single question. And the problem is that people sometimes genuinely forget the question. So if you make them all required, well, then they can't because they can't hit submit until they've done every single one of them. That's great. That's, that's that side of the equation. Now think about the respondent again. You know, how often have you sit there trying to hit submit and it doesn't work and you're scrolling up trying to find that stupid question that you forgot and you're going to click somewhere in the middle of that line and you don't care. You want to just submit this thing. <laughs> so that's the a, that's a flip, flip side of it. You know, you're sometimes also uncomfortable answering something. You, have, you can't answer it because no the options apply or you just don't understand the question. We talked about these three things too. Or you've genuinely forgot it and you don't want to go back. So that is, these are all reasons to make everything optional. These are all reasons to make everything required. There is no real best way, and, best, and, and my suggestion is this, but there is no software for that. You, everything is optional. That's what we've done in the engineering survey now. But you have a little counter next to the submit button that says five open questions left or three open questions left. That kind of alerts people to like, oh, I forgot one, if they're trying to do all of them. Or they go, oh, yeah, I skipped two or three, whatever. So you kind of give these with making everything optional you make the respondents happy which is the most important part but you have some check on these things that people just forget a question uh, by reminding them how many they uh, have left so i talked about survey tools already uh google forms i can wholeheartedly recommend it it's, it's very good for most surveys uh you get these nice spreadsheets out of it that are very useful uh survey monkey is pretty good they're very big this is a nice thing limesurvey.org it's not as clean uh, looking as Sur uh, survey monkey but pretty good and this is open source so you can self-host it so if you actually want to do a lot of um surveys or survey monkey gets expensive at that point or if the results are very sensitive and you don't want to trust a third party with it this you can just host it's an easy uh, whatever it is something web server that you do um oh i got survey monkey twice sorry about that uh, there's like a thousand others uh, so i had a couple to go in and out but these really are um, the main three that i know of any things that i missed do you guys remember no I get every now and then some new ones in. Um, if you want to uh, read more about this, this Qualtrics, Qualtrics is one of the other providers, by the way, uh, have a nice blog with a really easy read, you know, Friday uh, at 7 at the campfire, you can read something about surveys if you want, uh, or on your weekend. If you really want to know the nitty gritty, then the uh, Pew Research here has a whole methodology on how they actually do um, uh, countrywide surveys and they have a whole page also of how they formulate their questions so it's absolutely worth reading and uh, yeah this is goes way deeper this is like a whole textbook on on uh, social research methods and it has a whole part of course about questionnaire design um, then the question is okay you have all these results what you're gonna do with it um, if you have less than say 40 people just do some averages and don't forget to plot stuff plots make stuff re things really really interesting plot every question versus versus every other question 90% of that you'll throw away and at 10% that you go oh wait that's interesting that's really the, that's where your findings are uh, if you have larger numbers you should really do a proper uh, statistical analysis uh, 
principal components analysis, factor analysis, multivariate analysis, latent variable models, all that stuff. This gets somebody some decent knowledge. If you really want, you can read this book. It's only 700 pages, so you know. After that, you can do it. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of people around who have read this book or similar books. Uh, there's a whole bunch of approaches that constantly change. In the end, they're not that hard. It's just work. And if you're doing for the first time, it's a lot of work. And if you're doing for the second time, you go, oh yeah, it's not that bad. Thank you. That was it. Any questions? Yes. Have you put any of this to use when like this, uh, designing screeners? Because that's the closest analog I can think for most of the stuff here that we would use when we're using uh, screeners. So what do you call a screener? Oh, sorry. So in the design practice, before you, you need to find people that you want to interview. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, have I put this into, uh, any of this in practice for in, in writing screeners, which are little questionnaires that we do to find people to then qualitatively interview, right? Yeah, they do that. Do, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. I've used it in other places, but not for these uh, screening interviews uh, yeah, I questionnaires. Think most of these have come up, like, when I talk to designers that used to be in this office. Um, most of these ideas come through and you would iterate through even then. They're not as long, I guess, to take because our screeners are <coughs> intended to be super short, like five questions to a long screener. Yeah, yeah, no, you're totally right. So, so screener interviews, they tend to be five questions because you really don't want to waste anybody's time and you want to, it's better to get some more people calling you and then realize, oh, actually, you're not, you're not eligible for this than have nobody call you. So usually you just, you know, filter out the people who you really don't want and then the rest, you hope that they contact you and then you can see what you can do with them. Yeah. Uh, what you say there, I'll also say is, is interesting is often these questions is kind of passed around and usually they tend to get better over time just because more people look at them and at one point people will go, oh, this is actually two questions in one. Let's split this up. But, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at one recently, so I, I should. You're right. Yes, John? Yeah, the point about frequency over recency. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like asking the recency question helps mitigate the frequency problem? That is, if someone were to sort of be forced to think through the recency part first, does that improve, yeah. that have any impact at all on a subsequent frequency uh, question? So the question is whether maybe first asking people a recency question, how long ago have you last drank Pete's coffee, and then asking the frequency, whether that would help with the problems of the frequency. Um, I'm not aware of any research on that. I, I would figure it would. Um, I, I mainly see it as it, it answers different questions, and they both have the limitations. Um, and yes, but normally I would ask both if I can, and put them far apart, actually. So actually I would do the opposite. I would ask about recency first, and then like 10 questions later about asking about frequency to kind of see that, that you know, it's an independent question. But I can also see your point. So I, I, I don't know. I, there might well be some research on that. Um, yeah. Uh, I've also once or twice seen you know, recency going one further, so one was the last time you did it, one was the time before that, but that gets really tedious. Uh, it's really hard to do for respondents too, so, yeah. Rowan? Yeah, is, is there like a known bias where people try to represent not themselves, but an entire community that they're part of, or an entire demographic, in a more or less favorable way? Like if you're doing a survey on smoking and health, Someone who's a smoker takes it and they answer as though they were healthier than they were because they think, oh, people think smokers have poor health, but I don't think that's true. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, when people answer, do they answer for themselves or for the group? And then the second part of the question is, or do they answer for what they think the group sh should, how the group should be perceived as, as it were? Yeah. I think it's part of one of those uh, biases I mentioned, but I'm not sure which. I think it's the. No, I'm not sure which one it would be. There's, there's way more biases than those. Uh, and the problem is really, it's getting, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of them. Uh, to avoid them is very, very hard. I mean, the really only way is to gain the, into the, your respondent's trust. Uh, usually use an open, if the situation is very thorny, use open questions instead of just go away from interviews altogether, you know, talk with these people, spend some time with these people, and then kind of tease out these, these questions. That's the only way to kind of avoid most of those biases. Uh, they're just inherent in, in survey. Uh, design because yeah people do that they go oh they want to hear that as a smoker I'm unhealthy so I'm gonna like up all my health metrics here yeah yeah that's that's there's nothing we can do about that um, well it's not completely true you can for example how uh, ask them when's the last time you went to the doctor stuff like that so other than asking them for opinions you can ask them for facts that are verifiable and that tends to give you slightly more objective answers but again there you know they might just leave some stuff out in the end you're at the mercy of your respondents <laughs> Any further questions? Great. Well, that was it.
See you next time.